I think the hardest part of all of this for her is, is the mom guilt that, mm. that's there. It, it's very different. And, uh, you know, moms have just, they, they feel more responsibility. They feel more weight when they are not around with kids. I, I, I'm making a generalization here, but that's <laughs> so sexist, what I would kidding. say is, is the normal thing there. Right, right. Men, men I think, are just a, a little bit different in terms of something like that. We, when we're going through all of this kind of stuff, and if the roles were reversed, uh, I think Katie would probably have had, uh, I think she would have preferred to be in school um, before having kids. So then she could be mm. working and then have, you know, primary caregiver role kind of stuff there for the kids at this point. But that's mostly because she just feels the guilt of not being there and not being present most of the time. I, there, there's a lot of times that on the weekends, it's just straight studying. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my episode of Steering School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell, CRNA. And today we're going to discuss, can you have kids while you're in CRNA school? That's the big discussion today. Um, we have a very special guest, John. Welcome, John. Hi, everybody. Thanks for awesome. having me. Yes, we're happy to have you and grateful to have you. So for those of you who are not familiar with John Homer, um, maybe you are, because if you've been a part of the AACN, you might recognize his voice. And if you're watching on YouTube, he doesn't have his normal gear on, you know, the Elton John look, but you know, he he's, you, you might, will probably recognize him from his time and in, in involvement with the AACN. So some background on John is that John has been a CRNA for four years now. He's currently practicing in the fantastic paradise of Kokomo, Indiana. I actually laughed when I read that. I'm like, is this like the Beach Boys song? Um, but no, that no, is no. a real place. Only Kokomo, Indiana. There's not one in Florida. <laughs> right. Not one in the Bahamas. This is just in Indiana. So that's what the Beach Boys song was about. Um, all right. So John was an ICU nurse for 11 years prior to anesthesia, which is also kind of a, an awesome topic to maybe dive in a different day. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I've been out of school for so long, but 11 years, um, he practiced as an ICU nurse. Um, and so he started off in Southern New Mexico and then central Illinois as a CV ICU nurse. He attended Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio. Whoop, whoop, go Cleveland. Uh, mm -hmm. Graduated in 2018. Um, after grad school, he worked in Akron, Ohio. Oh yeah, AK Rowdy. Let's big shout out to AK Rowdy. Right. <laughs> uh, he worked at Summa Medical Center, um, which is in my hometown, um, gaining excellent experience to ERAS, which if you're not familiar, it's essentially opioid sparing techniques. Um, so therefore he has a heavy focus in experience in regional anesthesia. Uh, John has been involved in the national organization through critical care nurses, the AACN, um, I'm seeing their annual NTI conference, which by the way, mark your calendar is May 22nd and 24th in Philadelphia this year. Be there or be square. <laughs> um, yes, he's been emceeing for the last six years, which is why I said you might recognize him and even recognize his voice if, um, on the podcast. He's also emceed a number of state meetings for the AANA. Um, John and his wife, Katie, have two kids, um, Kipton and Poppy, four and two. Um, they moved two years ago, uh, so Katie could attend CRNA school in Indiana, which sounds like a challenge on so many levels. Um, he's excited to share his journey and experience with you all today. So essentially, the reason why I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get John on this podcast, because not only have they survived John's time in CRNA school, now the roles are reversed. <laughs> so I'm sure you're probably wondering, well, which role has been harder, to be in school or to be the spouse of someone in CRNA school, um, especially with two kids? Uh, so we're going to uh, kind of save this juicy question uh, for last. Um, so make sure you stick around to the very end to see what John has to say about which role he thinks was harder and why that was. Um, so welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a blast. It's a blast. I love chatting with you guys all the time. It's uh... It's good to be able to, to share my share my knowledge and experience here. So uh, my, my wife's experience may be a little different than mine, so I'll try and speak to that. But uh, I, I'm sure she would uh, uh, not be so happy with me putting words into her mouth. So uh, <laughs> she's probably used to it by now. How long have you been married? <laughs> uh, enough, enough. Yeah, enough. seven, seven, eight years, something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's that's long enough to put words in each other's mouth for sure. <laughs> Uh, well, thank Love you for being here. It's an honor. I know you're busy. Um, so we'll kind of uh, dive right into the questions. Um, first, I would love to kind of back up a little bit and talk about your CRNA school experience. Um, you didn't have kids then, is that correct? No, no, not at all. So so I had done all my undergrad in New Mexico. I worked out there for a few years, moved to central Illinois. I worked at uh, Carl, which was a big, uh, it was about a 500 bed hospital. That's where I really found out what CRNAs did. And I didn't really understand what they were. They 
we had a small group in, in New Mexico, but they really wasn't apparent that they were even a thing at that point. So it wasn't until I got to Illinois that I even found out about what uh, CRNAs were. And after I saw a number of people going through the ICU and then going on to CRNA school, I was like, all right, well, I, I was either on an administration track or on uh, a, a CRNA track. Those were the two. And I really loved the clinical experience of things. Being in the CVICU, that gave me uh, the closest thing that I think to what you can have in the operating room doing open heart recoveries, which was certainly one of the favorite, one of my favorite things that we got to do. So we, uh, I, I worked there for about eight years after uh, being in New Mexico, eight years in uh, CVICU at Carl, and uh, I had applied a couple of different times to, uh, to, to some schools and we got waitlisted and different things like that. Applied out to Cleveland and got waitlisted out there as well. And they actually had an opening at one point. So we found out uh, like right after we got married uh, in December that we were going to be moving to Cleveland. So that's uh, essentially what we did. We moved out there. Uh, Katie was, uh, she was a surgical ICU nurse, surgical pediatrics trauma. That We had two ICUs at this place. One was hearts and the other one was everything else. So she did <laughs> pediatrics, trauma, neon, all, all oh, of that wow. stuff went on to go do flight nursing for a number of years. So she was a flight nurse when we left Cleveland. She came out to, when we came out to Cleveland, she was doing travel nursing at the time there because that was just some of the best money at the time. And this was pre-COVID, this was before all of that, but it was still better money than what you would get working at the bedside. So she worked at uh, Clean Clinic. She went up to Detroit, did a couple of contracts out there. She worked at Akron Children's. She, she's been all over the place in, in terms of some of the different assignments that she was doing while I was in school. And uh, that seemed to work out fairly well. We, we lived comfortably. I mean, it was financially somewhat strained at times there, but you know, that's what loans are for. You right. take on all of that stuff and <laughs> you will pay it back eventually. Yes. So it's, uh, it's certainly one of those things you're like, okay, we're just gonna tie all this together and we'll right. figure it out later. So it, that's it's the best do. investment really if you think about it for over a long, long-term career wise. I mean, the fact right. that you increase your earnings $100,000 per year for every year that you work for like, yeah, that's 20 right. years. That's, that's a lot of extra money. So a hundred thousand alone, 200, 300 might seem like a lot in the moment, but as long as you're smart about your finances, it's a worth, exactly. it's a worthy investment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you bet. Absolutely. There. So yep. a few things you said that I really love is the fact that you said that you actually got, not that I love that this, we got waitlisted, but I like to highlight this because you, you were a really I mean, from a, a perspective of like a candidate, you were a really well-rounded candidate, um, someone who had a sure. lot of leadership skills and you still got waitlisted. Um, yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people are probably wondering, well, well, John, what were your stats? You know, and I know you yeah. your, your yeah. IQ experience, but would you mind sharing? I know I wasn't even going to ask you this today, but would you mind sharing a little bit more about like what your yeah. GPA was yeah, okay. or, and things like that? Yeah, you bet. You bet. My GPA was about a three, 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 four, I believe in that range, three, two, three, four, something like that. And uh, I had my CCRN. I had done that for a number of years. Um, part, of, part of the thing, I think also, some schools are a little bit more hesitant uh, to take on uh, students that are like 35 and older. There, There's just statistics that are involved in terms of your first time uh, taking the NBCRNA that they're a little bit more hesitant with. They want to make sure that you're going to be both academically and clinically prepared for those things. So they take a number of different things that are looking at that stuff. Uh, a, a number of schools, I think, are now even moving away from the GRE because they're realizing that more of the emotional intelligence piece of things is a, a much better predictor for how people are going to do in school than is some of these academic statistics. We can teach anesthesia. You can teach anesthesia to just about anybody, but I think it's all of these other pieces getting you through school. Those are the types of things that I think a lot of schools are starting to recognize now. Mm -hmm. So my, my grades were not stellar. I mean, I, I had, I was on the cusp for that kind of stuff. I had to, mm -hmm. um, for, for one of the schools, I had to retake uh, chemistry and show that I was uh, going to be a valuable candidate at that point. And I think, you know, some of these other schools want you to take some of their pre-courses to actually show that you're invested in that school as well, which is perfectly fine if, if you want to stick around in that area. So there's di different things that you can do ahead of time that really kind of give you a leg up. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I just want to point out too, because the fact that you're also a speaker, I mean, you're very well spoken. So I'm sure your interview skills are, are, are awesome. So, but it just goes to show that even a great candidate can still face a waste wait list or a rejection, which is essentially what I'm trying to highlight here that you have gone on to have a very successful career. 
um, and doing a lot of different types of anesthetics. And, but yet you were one of those candidates who was put on a wait list. Um, and so yeah. I like to share that because I think it gives people some hope because I think some people just get so in their own head thinking, well, they don't want me, but that's just not it. I mean, really a wait list is actually a yes. Um, right. and even a right. rejection is not, a, I mean, I was rejected from Syrian school, not even a wait list, like just no, right. no, thanks Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> so, but here I am. Right. So it just goes to show that just don't give up on your dreams. Right. Um, and yeah. as John said, you know, there's things you can do to overcome what you, what they may see as your shortcomings. Right. 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 Different schools are looking for different things as well. One may be very heavily involved in the academic portion of things. Mm -hmm. You, They may put a lot of weight onto one of their pretests. And another one is going to be much more of a, all right, tell us about the support systems that you have. Tell us uh, kind of some of the experiences that you have. They don't necessarily focus as much on the academic piece. They want to know that you have the experience. They want to know that, that you're dedicated to that and want to know that you're at a base level for some of this stuff. But at the same time, that doesn't necessarily translate into how well you're going to be able to manage uh, anesthesia school as a whole. Right, right. Okay, I love that. So thank you for sharing all that background. Um, let's get kind of back into what we were going to discuss today. But as far as being in school now, um, Katie's in school, would you say even the first go around, I'm kind of curious, um, would you say that was hard on your marriage? Or did you feel like going into that, you had a good enough um, understanding of what the expectation was? And did, how did you guys navigate those waters? So I think part of the benefit was that Katie and I were both nurses ahead of time. We both kind of knew what CRNA school entailed. We had had a number of friends that had gone on to do that. So we, we knew the kind of stressors that were going to, that the environment was going to create in the first place. So we had a little bit of a leg up in terms of that. For people who have uh, spouses outside of the healthcare industry, it can be kind of hard to translate just the amount of time and effort that something like this is going to take the every program is going to have their stressors every program is going to have different pieces that are really going to uh, to test things for you but i think having that open conversation ahead of time in terms of understanding how much time this actually takes there you will never have a down moment there's always something hanging over your head until you are done with boards that is the nature of it for three years that's what it's going to be so understanding that your spouse is going underneath all of that stress and anything that you can do to help alleviate that is going to make things a whole lot easier on them. Different people handle stress differently, obviously. And, uh, you know, some people crawl into a hole, some people uh, dance breaks. I, I don't know. I don't know what you do to handle stress. I, I hope it's not, you know, alcohol and, and, you know, curling into a ball, but if that works for you, so be it all the same. Anything you can do to get through CRNA school is it, that's what you need to do. And part of it is just being able to have those conversations uh, with your spouse in terms of something like that. So we, we had a good, we, we had a good understanding ahead of time before we got into it, what kind of stuff was going to be going on. But for people who don't know, you, you need to be able to have that conversation. It's going to be 40, 50, 60 hour weeks right. uh, with not much time on the weekends. Right. Right. hundred percent. I love that you said that. And that's really the, the key. And my, my husband at the time, he was not medical, um, and I had to do a lot of explaining now, my husband, I mean, bless his soul. He's always been, he's like my biggest fan, which I'm so grateful for. I mean, literally anything I've ever said, and I think I could be crazy sometimes. He's like, sure, Jenny, I'll, I'll support you. And I'm like, yeah. okay, I don't know what I'm yeah. doing, but let's do it. Um, but it was one uh -huh. of those things where it, 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 even though I told him until we were actually in it, I remember there were several instances during school that I don't think he quite realized until I had right. some breakdowns, right. Until I started with some tears and I remember getting mad at him. One of the only fights, one of the only fights, not the only one, but one of the only ones I really remember was when we fought over him asking me to do something. And it seems so silly now that like, I got upset about him asking me, Hey, Jenny, you want to go do this? Like whatever, there was a, you know, church youth group thing or going out with a friends or whatever it was. He used to ask me to do things all the time, like on the weekends or whenever. And I got so mad at him. I said, no, I'm like, stop asking me. Like, I don't want to have to say no, because I want to. Yes, of course I want to, but I can't like, ah, the fact that you ask me is like stabbing a knife in an open wound every time, you know? Right. Um, and then he was like, right. whoa, where did that come from? Right. And I was like, well, let's talk about this. And so that was a very eye-opening moment for me in school where I was like, oh, maybe I didn't make that as clear as I should have. Um, and then once yeah. we, what we started doing was we started, I started looking at my calendar ahead of time and saying, I can clear space for you here, here, and here, but outside of this, do not ask. Um, and that right. worked really well for us. Um, so that was, that was helpful. But again, he just didn't know. Um, but incredibly supportful nonetheless. And we, our marriage was completely fine afterwards. Um, we went on to have three kids and you guys went on to have kids too. So yep. 
Yeah. Yep. And you're still married. So <laughs> still married. Uh, yeah. You bet. So Round that's, that's kind of number one, okay. but I, um, you know, I guess too, you guys, I think you have to understand, like John also said, is how do people handle stress? You know, your spouse well, at least I would hope that you would know your spouse well enough to know how they handle stress. Are they very vocal? Do they lock up? Do they shut down? Because that's also key because like, for me, I tend to lock up. I tend, or don't get me. I have two, I have two methods. I either get really quiet and I hold it in and then I cry or I word vomit all my stress out. And I stress other person out beyond belief. Like those are my two, those are my two things. Um, right. but depending on how I react, my husband knows where I'm at. Like he even said to me recently, cause he's like, Jenny, I could just see it in your eyes. I can see it. I can tell when you're zoned out. I can tell when you're stressed out. So he tries to snap me out of it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think it's just paying attention to those subtle clues to your significant other. And that's not even going for like, when you're in school, it's going for like me paying attention to my own spouse since you're in school. Like I remember right. my word vomit days where I would just lay into him. Like, this is all I have in my mind. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I could tell he was like tensing inside, like, ooh, ooh. like, and he doesn't like, he handles stress good, but he internalizes it so much to where he breaks himself apart inside. So I had to be careful right. that I recognized that when I knew to just like, okay, maybe he's had too much, right? Like I can't keep right. call up my girlfriend right. at that point and lay into her some, because then we're both in yeah. school and then she can understand like, oh yeah, Jenny, this is my day. And I'm like, ah. right. <laughs> so yeah. no, exactly. I love that. It's great advice. Um, yeah. Now that your wife's in school though, um, you have two mm -hmm. little kids, you work full time. Um, and I know you said in the early in my in the intro, you moved to be closer to family. Um, was that kind of a, a purposeful decision when she chose a CRNA program? That was, that was. Cleveland was was a great spot for CRNAs in, in general. I mean, they, they understand CRNAs well. They've got great practice, uh, authority, autonomy, uh, which I really enjoyed quite a bit. Um, coming to Indiana, Indiana is not necessarily as friendly of a state. This is the land of Stolting. Uh, and he was very much against this anesthesia care team model. So we, we have a limited number of CRNAs in the state that is starting to expand and they're starting to give us more, more capabilities within here, but it, it's, it's underneath resistance. So we, uh, we're still fighting for a lot of that stuff here at this point. But when we were looking at schools, part of it was trying to figure out something that was closer to her family because we knew that they would be um, ones that would be able to, to help kind of support us through a lot of this stuff. They still live in Champaign, which is a couple of hours away, but it's not an eight hour drive anymore. It's a two hour drive. So if we had something that we needed for a weekend, if we needed something that we needed during the week or something like that, they can come over, help out with the kids. We've had a number of times there where, especially during COVID stuff, where you have an exposure, kids are home for 10 days and you're like, okay. Uh, so we uh, just uh, called up grandma and grandma came over for, for a week to come hang out with them. So we're uh, very grateful that, that we have them at least in that type of proximity. It would be even nicer if they were a little bit closer, but I'll take whatever we can get here. This this was a, a great school for us to be able to get into. And, and it was certainly one of those things that now that we're in the midst of it, you manage things as it comes along. Yes. Okay. I love that. And I think that's really key, you guys, to kind of, and most of the students I've talked to that have been through CSBA and who have student or students have children, um, they all say the same thing. They have family help. Now, maybe it's not family, but maybe it's a family friend, uh, a brother-in-law, sister-in-law, um, an uncle, a cousin, a friend. I mean, just someone that is yeah. reliable as a second caregiver to your children that you trust that can be there when you need it. Because sometimes you get stuck in clinical. Um, right. Sometimes you have to leave right. before you can even put them in daycare. I mean, some daycares don't even open till six and you have to get to the hospital at 530. So what do you do, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. a lot and of that's challenges. Exactly, yeah, that, that's exactly one of the biggest challenges that we've had is uh, kitty clinicals at this point are there uh, just two days a week. She goes to four days a week starting her senior year in, um, in May. So we have been trying to coordinate how all of that works. We have uh, a nanny who comes over early in the mornings on the days that Katie's in clinical. She's currently in Nashville right now, two days a week, which, uh, you know, she's traveling four, four and a half, five hours. So she leaves the night before, doesn't get home until 10, 11 o'clock the, the second night. Uh, and then she's on, on for the kids the other two days at this point right now. But right now we do have a nanny that comes over those two days. I have to leave at 5.30 to be able to make it to uh, to, to work by 6.30 so I can start up cases. So mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly 
biggest challenge is coordinating all of that, making sure that you have some other pieces in place, having a backup plan. Uh, this same the same nanny is available in the afternoons if I get hosed and I get stuck in a case where I'm sitting and just uh, waiting to get out. But yeah, daycare closes at uh, at six, so I've got to be down there to be able to pick them up in in time for that. Right. So it's it's just knowing what your limits are, and this is also an advantage with someone who doesn't work in healthcare that doesn't have to be there at the ass crack of dawn. Uh, they can actually help get the kids to and from school yes. a little bit easier. A more traditional schedule is nice. That that yes. helps, but uh, it certainly is. Uh, it, 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 every situation is going to be a little bit different in terms of how the two of you are going to manage that. Yeah, hundred percent. And then, like you said, when the kids are sick, and it's like, oh no, <laughs> what are right. you going to do? And I remember, I'll yeah. never forget when I was Cal, our first, our son, who's now six, when he was maybe a year and a half, he got well, he got like hand, foot, and mouth. Which you know, when you get that, you get sores, and you can't go back to the sores are all dried and crusty. And you're like, come on, right. you're like blowing on them, trying to get them to crust up. You know, you're like hurry up, these out. <laughs> rub him out. Yeah. Then of course he got something else where he had a, a really scary fever where, um, I went to call in. I mean, it was like 105 plus, like barely, like he was, it was scary. I thought I was gonna have a seizure. And I remember calling in the morning and my chief steering was like, well, you know, if you call in one more time, you're gonna be put on disciplinary action. And I was scheduled to do like an open heart case that day. And I was like, why don't we, you know, me, I'm like, I don't want to be in trouble. Like, you know, this is my career. Like, I, I don't want to be like, I'm, I'm a good worker. I'm, I, I just, but I have a sick child. Like, are you serious? Right. And so anyways, and, and obviously my husband could stay home with him. I get it, but my husband's not medical and mama bear is like, my baby might have a seizure. I want to make sure I'm watching with a hawk, you know? So my husband's like, and I'm like, how's he doing? Like, oh, he's fine. I look over like drooling spit everywhere. We're like, oh, okay. All right. You know? So I love my husband, but I'm like, it's just not the same. So I went to call yeah. in and they told me that. So I actually went in in tears. Like I remember I cried the whole way into work and tried to dry up my tears, my puffy eyes before I went into the OR and I'm getting ready. And, um, the RT, the respiratory therapist, she was setting up the A line. She's like, Hey Jenny, she's like, you don't look okay. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm not okay. I'm like, but I'm here. I'm here. I'm just pissed off and I'm here. <laughs> you know, I was like really angry at that point. And then she's like, well, like what's wrong. And of course, then I just started like, Bleh. I just started crying again. I'm like, no. And then of course my coworkers came to the rescue. They're like, Jenny, you shouldn't be here. Get out of here. And I got to go home and they didn't put me on disciplinary action. But I was like, I just, it was one of those pivotal moments in my career that I was like, wow, wow. This is how a good employee is treated. I mean, granted, I was really grateful that my, my coworkers stepped up, stepped up for me and was like, Jenny needs to go home. Right. She can't be doing this case. Um, and I got right. to leave or whatnot, but it was like, just a reminder that like, man, being a parent's hard and you're right. When a, a certain family member isn't in a medical system where like you're held to three call offs in six months. I mean, my husband could really honestly miss as much work as he wanted. Um, and yeah. he can go in whenever he wanted and end whenever he wanted. He might make up for on the weekends, but it was really flexible to work from home kind of job. Um, right. But that does make things easier where healthcare workers kind of have a hard. I mean, they're held to yeah. a pretty high standard. You have to clock in on time every single time. It's, yeah. it's you know, my husband rolls in 10 minutes late and it's like, whoop, all right. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I just want to share that story, but just Absolutely. get through it, but it's hard. Um, now, what would you say if you had to pick one thing? Um, oh, I don't think I asked you this question. I think I kind of, so you said Katie's traveling a couple days a week and you're kind of you're sh shuffling all that. And that's kind of what it looks like right now. Okay. How often would you say you get to have quality family time? I would love to ask that question. You know, most of it, Katie does a great job in terms of balancing that out. I, I think the hardest part of all of this for her is, is the mom guilt that, mm. that's there. It, it's very different. And, uh, you know, moms have just, they, they feel more responsibility. They feel more weight when they are not around with kids. I, I'm making a generalization here, but that's <laughs> So sexist. What I was just kidding. <laughs> is, is the normal thing there, right? Right. Men, men, I think are just a, a little bit different in terms of something like that. We, when we're going through all of this kind of stuff, and if, if the roles were reversed, uh, I think Katie would probably have had. Uh, I think she would have preferred to be in school um, before having kids, so then she could be hmm. working and then have you know primary caregiver role kind of stuff there for the kids at this point. But that's mostly because she just feels the guilt of not being there and not being present most of the time. I, there, there's a lot of times that on the weekends, it's just straight studying. And so I'm taking the kids out to try and find something to wear off as much energy as possible, whether that's the park or the pool, or just running around in circles with our heads <laughs> cut off. That's, that's fantastic. Anything you can do is uh, really just kind of what is going here. And, and I think the age of kids as well influences this. 
when you have young kids, young kids may not remember most of this stuff later on, but they are very labor intensive in terms of the stuff that you have to do. You have to make sure that they're not sticking their head in the oven, you know, every 10 minutes sort of a thing. As kids get older, they get a little bit more self-sufficient and they may remember a little bit more of that, but it, it, this is going to be a blip in time. And after all of that is done, the lifestyle that you can have after this point is absolutely worth it. So you, you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of your schedule. Uh, and what kind of hours you want to work and where you want to work. There, there's a lot of different options that happen after you're done. So you can get through three years of something like this, you, you'll be set. But I think that uh, the, the hardest part right now is just trying to coordinate all of that. And mm -hmm. part of it is, I'd say that we probably have, um, when previous semesters, when it was very heavy in terms of exams, it was, you know, every other weekend kind of a thing that she had studying that she was going to be doing for one test or a paper or another or something like that. As the program progresses, that requirement kind of dissipates a little bit more. Yes, there's more papers, uh, the DNP project that that will consume a significant amount of time. But I think that those exam piece of things that you're really hammering down, trying to make sure that you are ready for those, uh, that takes up a significant amount of time and and just a lot of stress during those times. So we still, I'd say, probably have at least two weekends uh, a month that we are able to do some really good quality time with family. Yeah. And we have, uh, we've got, and, and part of that too is it's bouncing. It's, it's like, okay, why don't you wake up, get some studying done up until noon. I'll manage them until that point. After naps, we'll go do something as a family. Zoo. So yeah, exactly. you, you have a little bit more, if you break it up like that, that's a little bit better. I think the hard part for Katie is that her study mates, her friends uh, mm -hmm. don't necessarily, they, they don't have kids. It's not that they don't have other things that they're doing, but they don't have kids. So it's a little different for her when they are able to take an entire weekend doing some of the stuff that she wasn't doing. And so she feels guilt on both ends. She's like, I feel guilty with not being my fine family. And I also feel guilty that I haven't gotten through 150 slides of cardiac here over the weekend. It, it, you're pulled in, in a lot of different directions that way. And anything you can do to kind of help alleviate some of that is, is what you, what you manage. Right. Exactly. And I, let's, let's stress the fact that perfection is not the key. You're not out to, you don't need to get straight A's to pass your A school. You just have to pass, right. you have to pass and get whatever their percentage is, but you know, don't hey, kill yourself. Great. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, you know, I think not striving for perfection is really key, especially if you're a parent, it's just get through it. Um, and, not, and the guilt's always going to be there too. I feel like even as a working parent, you're always going to have that guilt. I, I, I always hate my, my children are like, mommy, play with me. And I'm like, Woof. but I'm in the middle of cooking dinner and I have to feed you too. You know, it's like, or you know, whatever it is and like, play with me, mommy, play with me. And I'm like, oh, I feel, I just, or like maybe they're home for the day because it's a holiday or whatever. And I'm trying to work from home, but they're here. They're like, well, if you're here, you're going to play with me. Right. And it's like, Ooh. so I feel like it, I, I experienced that too. And it is so hard and you're right. When they're younger, they're not going to remember as much but they're also a lot more like work because like physical work, um, like our, I'm sure our youngest, he's 18 months now, but like maybe what was it in the summer, June, I don't know. So whatever he was like 14 months, whatever he was, I, we literally turned an eye off him for we were at a graduation party, turned my back for like five minutes. He went into the house with dad. I'm blaming this on dad because it just, just has to be dad. Um, so dad mm -hmm. takes all the kids in the house to get some cake or something like that. I come in like five minutes later and I'm like, where's Caden? Like our youngest. <laughs> excuse me. And next thing I know, I see Caden walk around the corner and he has something in his hand and he's put in his mouth. And I go, what is that, Caden? It's liquid ant bait. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm like, how much of this did he suck on? And I'm like, ah, so here we are like calling poison control at a graduation party. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Anyways, luckily you need a lot of ant bait to do some damage, but I was like, oh, think they get into, they get into. That's oh yeah, exactly. you're right. They're so dangerous. And so you right. have to really, it's like you, you cannot, like, I think parent, it's unrealistic to think you can take, you can work and do something while you have a toddler in the same room or even in the right. same house. It's because it, we've even had caregivers come to the house and watch our children while I'm home. And that's even hard because the kids will always find right. you. And you're like, yep. uh, I'm paying someone to watch you right now. Like, so go bother them. <laughs> you know? That's what yeah. they're here for. Right. So it's just, it's yeah. just hard. And especially if you're with classmates who don't have that experience, it's just like you said, right. the lifestyle is different. And it's funny because if I think back to my time in Sierra school, I thought it was a lot of work and I thought it was really hard. But if I compare my life now with everything we're juggling now, I'm like, well, heck, I had it good. You know, like I actually mm -hmm. think that was freaking easy compared right. to what I'm doing now. And I'm like, 
I have way more to juggle on my plate now than I ever did back then, but I felt overwhelmed because it was perspective, right? It's what something I had never experienced right. before. So it was like a new phase. Um, yep. But we are capable of a lot more than what I think people think. Um, you just right. got to push yourself there, right? Um, so it's doable, I guess is what I'm saying. It's not easy, but yeah. it's doable. And I love what you shared. You still get quality time. You can still work yeah. it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you need you need some break away from CRNA school as well. Yes. Uh, that, that kind of balance is important. If you are just CRNA all the time, uh, you, you're going to burn yourself out. 100%. You need that. You need that enjoyment factor in your life for sure. Um, yeah. So let's get into what would you say is the hardest part then of juggling? Oh, and I also want to mention, well, we'll get into this, but what would you say is the hardest part of juggling kids and also supporting your wife? Like from you as a spouse perspective, what would you say is like that? Where you just want to so scream, I, I, like, ah. Right, right. Well, I think part of it is just uh, entertaining the kids. It, mm -hmm. You know, that you are, uh, I mean, it, it's essentially being like a single parent at this point because you have, uh, you, you're just the one that is on all the time, especially when, when Katie's gone during these days. There's no one else that's there. So it's just you. You're the one that's responsible for them. If something goes bad, how you're feeding them, getting them to bed. So things just take a, a lot more time. You don't have that. Uh, you, you don't have a, a united front. You don't have someone to share uh, in a lot of the time that it takes to, to deal with, with kids, whether that's just a bedtime routine. You know, a bedtime routine with the two of us takes half an hour, 45 minutes between baths and, and mm -hmm. stories and stuff like that. Uh, alone, it takes an hour to an hour and a half when you're trying to get them fed and everything yeah. else. So it, jump it's on just, the bed you gotta, and like gotta bounce back and like forth that. between the two of them. Yeah. Exactly. You got one monkey on your back, the other one crawling on your leg. So it's, uh, <laughs> that, that I think is, is the hardest part is that you were just the only one that, that is kind of involved at that point. And for even if she wasn't traveling or doing something like that, it still is one of those things you want to be able to give them the amount of time to study, to be able to focus on what they're doing. So you're trying to keep them uh, out of the way uh, a lot of the time that's mm -hmm. that's what ends up being yeah. so I think that's the that's the the hardest part about things is just making sure that they that, that, that your spouse is the is able to focus their attention on what they need to do at the time yeah so that's amazing that you're that's like that's like a huge gift let me just tell you that right now so kudos to you because like that it is such a huge undertaking to do that but that is such a huge gift that you're giving Katie and I mean, I know she knows it, but I, I just feel like I, the kids, the thing is the reality is the kids don't know. The kids are going to be happy no. the day. They're loved, they're fed, they got new toys, they got shoes, whatever. They're, they're happy. And what I kind of wanted to say, what I almost brought up earlier was the fact that like, if you include your kids on what your mission is, I mean, especially if you have older kids, younger kids, you know, maybe you don't get it, but you can equally say, right. hey, when mommy's done with CRNA school, we're going to go take a family trip to Disney or we're going to go right. whatever vacation you think they really want, the beach. Yeah. make it so like when mommy's done doing this, we get to go celebrate as a family to, to congratulate mommy for what she's achieved. And even for yeah. older kids, I think this is really important because it sees you, sees your, sees them work for a goal. Right. And it really gives a really great, like a uh, role model experience for them to see, wow, you know, this is what my mom did or my dad did. And they worked really hard. I watched them, you know, sometimes it wasn't very pretty, but I watched them do this and yeah. they did this because they knew they're gonna give us a better life afterwards. Right. They knew they're going to have a more flexible job. I mean, Katie can maybe work part-time. She will earn as much money as she was working full-time as a nurse, <laughs> which heck, really? that's what I did. I mean, that's ultimately one of the reasons why I went back to CRNA school is because one of my dreams was to be a part-time worker so I could be home with the kids because my parents both worked 60, 70 hour weeks growing up and we never had family gatherings. We, my, they all did, they just worked and worked and worked. And so I remember longing for that and thinking, well, if I could ever do something in my career, that allows me to make enough money to where we can be financially stable, but I can work part-time. That's what I'm going to do. And so right. what naturally that led me to CRNA, but again, I'm finally there, like in our career where I'm, well, I'm not technically working part-time, but as a CRNA, I am, <laughs> yeah. excuse me. Um, they gave me a cold too. Well, thank you children. <laughs> it's like daycare, you know, yeah. they bring in all the cooties, but, um, so right. I love that. I think that's great. Um, great perspective and a, and a huge gift. So if you're a spouse listening to this, if you're someone who are going to be trading off with someone, know that your time's coming, your turn's coming. And equally so, if you're in CRNA school and you know your spouse is, is being that person for you, just thank them and give them a hug. And you don't have to buy them anything, but I mean, I'm sure they'd be happy with a kiss, right? Just a, you know, like a beer is just fine. A know, beer, so. exactly. But yeah, I mean, I think it's like, that's important too, because I don't think I did that enough either 
there were definitely times in school where I know my husband made big sacrifices for me. And even now as uh, we're juggling three kids and I work part-time and we run, you know, technically now two businesses, <laughs> we're working more than full time, essentially between the two of us, he does so much so I can be more present and, and handle things. And I don't think I say thank you enough, even still to this day, but I, I do occasionally recognize when I'm being unpresent and I try to realize like, and just acknowledge that like, Hey, I know you're trying to snap me out of it the other night. And I appreciate that. I'm sorry. I didn't have the best tone, you know, and, no. and, and I, and he always appreciates when I do that. I don't probably do it often enough, but I do have reflection, I guess you could say. Um, so if you are a current student and you notice yourself kind of being sharp or nasty, but not because you're taking it out on them, but because you're frustrated with something else, be cognizant of that because it can wear over time on your significant other. Right, John? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just hard to do in the moment, but it, it eventually, right. hopefully, it comes back around. Um, yeah. So do you think having um, Julia, or of course, right? So funny story, before we did this episode, I didn't realize I copied and pasted this exactly the way I wrote it. Um, but before we did this episode, I, I Facebook stalked John. I'm like, what's his wife's name? I got to figure this out because I feel silly. I don't know. And is it your sister? Who that's my sister. My sister is Julia. Okay. Yeah. So of course I found his sister. I'm like, oh, that's his wife. <laughs> like, <"Bleh." laughs> yeah. So I was like, you know, Julia. And he's like, uh, my wife's name's Katie. I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel so silly. So anyways, you know, we'll just, we'll just let Julia know she's a part of this episode. You know, she'll fall into right. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so having Katie in Sierra school, um, do you think it's harder on you or do you think it's harder on the kids? Um, well, I think it's, Mostly it's hardest on Katie because okay. she is, she, she feels, uh, like I said, pulled in a number of different directions there. I, I don't think the kids, um, the kids are, are well entertained at this point. They, right. they've got daycare, they've got all of this kind of stuff. I mean, they see a squirrel and, <laughs> you know, they're distracted for the next 10 minutes. So at, at this age, at least my kids are, are they're going to be just fine. There's, there's moments when, when they're sad or, you know, they're, right. they're upset that they, that mom is not there to help put them to bed or something like that. But th those moments are rare at, at this point. I think, uh, um, it, it can be hard on, on me just in terms of knowing that I'm trying to manage all of the different things mm -hmm. between the house and work and kids, but I know that there's an end to this, mm -hmm. uh, this ordeal. There, there's a light at the end of the tunnel right. eventually. Right now, it may just be the train coming to hit me, but <laughs> I, I know that it's around the corner here, essentially. But yeah. I think uh, everybody's got their different stressors is, is what it comes down to. I, I'm not in this alone by any mm -hmm. means. And I know that I, I think one of the hardest things is that I know the stuff that Katie's going through. And mm -hmm. when she comes to me telling me about some of this stuff, I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> trying to have sympathy, you, but it's like, yeah, I, I've been there, done that. <laughs> this sucks. Yeah. This is yeah. one of those things that every school goes through. Every student has to deal with some sort of BS like this. Yeah. Suck it up kind of a thing. And it's like, so she doesn't necessarily get as much of the sympathy because <laughs> you know, I have been there. It's kind of like so. when your spouse complains because you're sick and you're like, I just worked. I, I didn't complain at all. And here I am, you know, if you want to have a little cough and you want to lay in bed all day, uh, no, thank you. Get your butt out of bed and make dinner. <laughs> so it's kind of those things where it's like, if I have to experience this and I have to muster up the energy to tough it out, yeah, I get that part where I think nurses are like the worst when it comes to that because we see sick people all the time. And, and, yeah. and same thing with like, you know, that experience of like, oh my gosh, this is happening. You're like, yeah, I know. Do you remember when I complained about it? You didn't seem to care then. <laughs> but it's like just the catch 22. Did you, die? Did yeah. you lose a leg? <laughs> exactly. No, you're still here and I'm still here. Um, so I think that's a great perspective. It's always temporary, it does stink. There are going to be times you're going to challenge you, but I always, I, at least the way I look at it now, and I didn't probably look at it like this in school. I wish I would have, it would have really helped me um, mentally it would have helped me. But the way I look at things now in my life, when I have, and I've had some really bad days, like really challenging days where I'm like, I feel like the, I'm being swallowed. Right. But what I try to say is I got to find a place of gratitude for what I'm experiencing, because if I didn't have the success that I have, or have the being, not being in CNA school, I wouldn't have the stress. And so really the stress is kind of a result of my success. And really when you're experiencing challenges and stressors, it's one of those things where it challenges you to think differently, do something differently, take action or not. But I mean, it challenges in a way that makes you grow as a person that you will come out better for, may not feel no. good going through it, but when she gets to graduation day, she's going to look back and be like, dang, I'm a badass. That's what she's going to think, yeah. you know? Yep. Yeah. 
Okay. So I think that's great. Yeah. Um, okay. So you guys, we're getting into the juicy questions because I like juicy questions. And I think if you're like me, my burning desire is to know <laughs> kind of if, if John had to say what he thinks was harder versus easier being in CRNA school or being the spouse on the receiving end with his wife in CRNA school, what would you say to that question? <laughs> I still think that uh, Katie has it harder right now. When, when I went through school, not having kids, not having to deal with any of that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's just a whole lot easier to uh, not only coordinate schedules, but you have a whole lot more free time to deal with. So my free time could be spent doing absolutely nothing. It could be spent studying and it could be spent socializing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't have the responsibility of kids at that point. So I think that um, being in Katie's spot right now where she's at with kids and CRNA school, I think she definitely has it harder. I, I, I mean, as frustrating as kids are at this age, uh, just like I said, trying to make sure they don't die. Uh, <laughs> it, it can be monotonous at times, but it really is not difficult work. I just, you know, have to deal with whining about <laughs> why I smelled the bathwater last night. And then my nose was Longed up for the next 15 minutes. So that, yeah, that's yeah. the kind of stuff. It's, it's just like, all right, I uh, <laughs> have a master's degree and I'm dealing with this. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, but right, right, then, right. They try your patience. Let's put it that way. And you're already at your breaking point most of the time. Um, and they do that on purpose, by the way, FYI. It's like they like to see what breaks you. <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous. But also, you yeah, look at it and reflect, you're like, okay, they have to learn too, right? They're that's actually right. learning what their boundaries are. It's the one way that kids learn is by testing the boundaries, which you know, it's just part of being a kid. Um, but I, I, you know, I would agree with you because now granted, we didn't have kids in CRNA school, but like when I, like I just spoke to you before, when I think like where my life is now and what we juggle now, I actually, and I, I know and I'm not trying to poo poo that CRNA school period for anyone. It's hard no matter where you are in life, but I right. will say CRNA school is going to be harder with kids. Is it undoable? No, hundred percent is doable, but yeah. it's going to look very right. different than your classmates. hundred percent. I play candy crush for like a solid hour after clinical when I didn't, have, I come home and I wanted to be like mindless zone out candy crash. Like I could not do that now. I don't even, we don't watch Netflix. We don't watch anything on TV, nothing. We haven't for like six years now. We last time we saw a movie was new year's Eve and we only watched half of it and went to bed. <laughs> like yeah. That's how sad yeah. our life. Like, we don't, we don't take that kind of time. If we have any free time, we're either doing, you know, things that are going to help grow the business or help, you know, help their kids or plan or like we, or talk like, or go out to dinner. Like we don't, we don't consume mindless content anymore. And actually, I really enjoy that. Um, we're yeah. like, I remember when I went to grad school, I used to watch all kinds of, I used to call it my trash TV. I'm sharing some, I don't anymore, but I call it trash TV because it was like Flavor Flav, Rock of Love, like total That's trash, true. you know? Yeah, yeah like uh, what's the other one? The, the, the dating one? I don't remember anymore. But yeah. I remember at the time when I went, got into grad school, I was like, I have to give up my trash TV. Um, and it's funny because at the time we had a little Pomeranian and he hated the f bomb. So every time I'd be like beep beep, he'd be like rrr rrr rrr, and he'd like run around our living room. And I'm like, well, at least it's gonna be happy for Prince because he's not gonna hear these f bombs during all the time. Um, and so we just got rid of cable, and it was like one of the best decisions that we ever did. And it was like freeing. And we're still to this day we don't watch TV um, or anything like that. But yeah, I think it's just a different set of priorities. And you'd be surprised if you really look at your daily schedule, what you're currently doing, how much free time you actually probably waste. And social media is one of those outlets that I think you don't probably realize what you're doing unless you actually track what you're doing. Um, think about it. You lay in bed at night and how many hours or and maybe at least an hour do you spend just mindlessly scrolling before you actually go to sleep? Like that should be cut out, period. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people want to share their journey these days, which I'm not. I think it's great. But equally so, don't spend hours scrolling social media before you go to bed. Get that hour of rest. Um, yeah. uh, that's my mama bear yeah. coming out. So. Um, so I'm glad you shared that, I guess, you know, what would you want to leave our audience with as far as if they're questioning whether they should do this with kids, have kids, um, it, well, it's absolutely true the, the most of it is you will adapt throughout the entire process. You will figure out what it is that is required of you, how you're going to manage that and open communication with your spouse, I think is, is the biggest key with all of that understanding that. Uh, this, this is my limitations. This is the kind of stuff that I have to do. Like you said, setting a schedule saying, hey, I've got this. Um, if you make sure that you have some of this time that's carved out that you are able to study and other time that is carved out specifically for, uh, for social time, for family, whatever it may be, 
those kind of things are important. You need to have those kind of boundaries and you need to be able to, to meet that kind of stuff as well. When you're going to commit to something like that, then do it. You know, don't, don't let that linger over your head. Be present in the moment with whatever you're doing. Mm. If, they're, if, if you are still thinking about whatever it is during your time with your family, that, that's really going to take away from some of that quality, quality time that you can really have with them and, and maintaining those connections. But it absolutely, absolutely is doable. You can do all of this kind of stuff and you will be able to make it through no matter what. That is such good advice, John, as far as being present for what you choose to be in in the moment. 100%. It's so much easier said than done. And it's so right. easy to catch yourself not doing that. <laughs> but I challenge you if you're listening, like what John just said was, if you choose family time, be 100% present in that family time. Don't be thinking about school, what you got to do, checking your phone, be present. You will enjoy it so much more. You'll get more value out of it. And so when you're in the school mode, 100%. It's school mode, not family mode, not social media mode. It's school mode. So when you do that, you're going to find that your time is going to become more manageable and you're also equally going to enjoy your life more. But right. you said a few other things. You said adaptability. You know, adaptability is, is huge. And really when you enter CRNA school, one of the reasons why CRNAs tend to be this type of person is because you tend to be adaptable. Um, so you already have the ability to be adaptable. So I love that too. Um, the last thing you said, which I think I want to drive home, and I've mentioned this before, and it's so crucial, and it's an equal an area in my life that has taken me this long in my adult life to where I'm like, wow, Jenny, I have terrible boundaries, like, but boundaries, um, you know, if you're a people pleaser, raise your hand. Yep, that's me. Yep, I, I have a heart, and that, I don't mind conflict, but clearly I, I've really thought about that in a way, because I'm like, why don't I like you know, why do I want to please people? Is it because I am afraid of conflict? And why is that? It's really made me assess that. And it's really gotten me feeling okay with saying no. And that is such a crucial, crucial, like I said, I got in a fight with my husband. I'm like, stop asking me because I don't want to, because I hated saying no, right. because I wanted to please right. him. I wanted to please yep. him. I wanted to say yes. And um, that was huge for me as far as even in my life to still this day, boundaries is huge. And just being the communication aspect of boundaries is really what makes boundary a boundary. You can't have a boundary right. without communication. Like yeah. other persons just think you're yeah. like, oh, well, that's not very nice. No, if they understood, they would get you that. You have to express it. You, exactly. you, have to, you have to state it out loud. Men, <laughs> right. men not just a are not good at reading subtle cues or obvious cues or any cues. So just <laughs> say it out loud. Tell us what you want. Exactly. Men need to hear it, girls. Men need to hear it. Say it out loud. Um, well, thank you, John. This has been so much fun. Uh, where can people find you? Um, I know I, I spoke that you're going to be at the, a well, we to be announced, um, but more than likely at the AAC. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to be back for uh, the National Teaching Institute again, which is uh, in Philly. That's uh, May 22nd through the 26th. I'll be emceeing the uh, the big super sessions that are there. Uh, Sean Patrick and I always have a great time with uh, with the critical care nurses. It's uh, it's one of my favorite things. So uh, you can email me at any time. It's John Homer, J-O-N-H-O-L-M-E-R at Yahoo. Um, uh, I've got a couple of different things on YouTube. Uh, if, if you need some entertaining stuff, uh, there's <laughs> some previous uh, uh, previous endeavors that I've done from uh, both ASN and some other stuff that I've done there as well. So yes, some, John's a comedian. Um, I'm looking forward to see what you what you dress up. <laughs> Yes. Me too. I don't know. I've got some things in the works, so let's we'll see yeah, what we can come I'm gonna up. Gonna start shopping with. now. <laughs> I know, right? Right. Supply yeah. chains. <laughs> I know, right? Because I'm from China. Yeah. Well, thank you, John. This has been so much fun. I appreciate your insight, and thank you. I know your time is valuable. Um, yeah, you guys. I hope you enjoyed the show, and thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you next week. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Hey, future CRNA, as always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you. So screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at CRNA School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to CRNAschoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your CRNA journey. Stay strong and I'll see you next week.